So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Elham Musavian with us. Uh, she's a Marie Curie uh, research fellow. Uh, she has uh, worked extensively on uh, masonry design and digital masonry design. She will explain better herself. Uh, I came across uh, very interesting pieces of work online when searching uh, um, almost desperately for, for some resources uh, on the subject of interlocking masonry designs and, and modular masonry designs. And I was so happy to find these uh, great uh, research articles. And then I thought, why not sharing this uh, joy and passion with you all? And I decided to invite Dr. Musarian and she was kind enough to accept the invitation. So. I'm really excited about the content and uh, we're going to really uh, bother her with a lot of questions. Uh, don't be shy, <laughs> this is maybe your first and last chance. I'm just kidding. Uh, we will we'll ask you for, for some more time and, and question and answer time pleasure. later. <laughs> and maybe uh, I hope I can manage to keep you around for some uh, in-depth in questions after, after the first part of the event which is for the, for the few students who are really working on, on the exact subject. Um, so without further ado, I will give you the floor for uh, as, as long as you want, <laughs> we are here. Uh, but we have planned for, for 45, 30, 35 to 45 minutes presentation, but the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And I am also very glad uh, today to be here and uh, give you this presentation on a topic which uh, I uh, focused on for about three years. So if you agree, I now share my screen because I prepared some presentation and then I can explain about my work on that. Okay. Okay. I hope now you can see. Uh, all right. So. Uh, the topic of uh, my project uh, has been uh, a structurally informed joint layout design, which that includes also different shapes of joint, including interlocking uh, joint. And uh, actually, if I want to categorize this project, I will put it in the uh, in the, uh, under the topic of a structurally informed shaped adjustment, which, for example, here. I present uh, the work of Emily Whiting on the uh, block assemblages, which the overall concept was to uh, change the uh, geometry of an invisible model, a structurally invisible model, uh, to automatically become feasible using some uh, tool, some uh, digital tool to do that. So, Based on this concept, uh, I developed uh, the project of a structural informed shape adjustment of uh, the joint between the blocks. And this is based on the fact that keeping the overall geometry of the discrete element assemblage the same, I try to find uh, the best shape uh, and the most structurally um, appealing uh, actually uh, shape for each of the blocks, including the joint between them. And that was the, so that we can uh, simply uh, make an invisible uh, joint shape feasible. So this also is the pipeline and overall concept of uh, what I want to explain you today. And this concept is basically uh, called as a segmentation, and you can see several works under the topic of segmentation, which is one of the uh, one of the tasks that we have to do, and inevitably because we always need to segment the overall assemblage because because of some manufacturing limits, we have to do that, or also. Uh, so um, so I just. Um, See the demo? Sure, yeah, what, uh, whatever you want, uh, that is fine. Uh, just so you will answer all the questions. Okay, I just read okay, the just, chat. Sorry, just, uh, <laughs> I, I just asked uh, if it's okay for sure, sure, questions yes. to be answered. Of course, so if, of course. If, if, you, if, if anybody has questions, so please type them in the chat then I will, I will notify Elham to answer. Thank you. 
So uh, I was talking about the segmentation and I told that segmentation is kind of an inevitable thing. We usually for some manufacturing limits, we have to do that. And simply for transportation, we need to do that. Otherwise we cannot do uh, simply transport things. And this becomes a more important issue when we're talking about the brittle materials like masonry, because when we have in the lack of tensile strength, then the concept of transportation becomes more challenging. And because of that, we uh, need to segment them. So based on this idea, the segmentation is done uh, to, uh, to fulfill several objectives. And these objectives could be based on the, for example, maximizing the construction needs, for example, based on uh, finding, for example, minimizing the, co uh, the cost of molding by, by penalizing uh, the overall assemblage, or for example, to discretize a model to minimize the size of the package, or for example, to simplify the assemblability. Also, the segmentation is based on uh, maximizing the visual appeal, which we can see historically in the brickworks. And uh, based on under the topic of astrotomy, we can see that. And nowadays, when you're talking about the transparent blocks, we also should consider the visual appeal of the interlocking joints, which uh, is visible. And then it's also an important thing that uh, should be, I mean, it's better to be taken into consideration. And the topic which I follow is about the structural aspects of segmentation, because we know that once we segment um, a structure, it uh, affects its structural behavior. And there are several studies uh, showing that, for example, different bond patterns, different types of segmentation affects the structure. Here, for example, I show you how the bridge pattern changes the flow of force on the um, very simple uh, barrel vault that you can see from top. And uh, also there are several works showing that, for example, using different interlocking joints, how the bending and flexural uh, actually resistance of a flat plate or any other shapes can be changed out of plane. Uh, flexural resistance of that can be changed. But all of these topics uh, were mostly following uh, this concept that they uh, use uh, one interlocking geometry as an input. And then uh, it gives you some output in terms of the structural feasibility of that. And for example, comparing to the existing models to say if it is improved or not, which they, definitely they are very interesting. But what I was uh, mostly uh, searching for was uh, finding some a design process that helps architects that given an uh, input as an interlocking assemblage, it's uh, the tool, the design process that um, uh, somehow allows them to improve uh, their uh, inputs and make it uh, structurally feasible. And we call it as a structurally informed design actually. And there are so limited number of tools and um, design uh, process in uh, this line, for example. And it's very limited to very, um, for example, limited shapes, for example, the shapes which are compression only, or so on and so forth, or very limited uh, types of material, materials which are fully rigid so that the materials cannot be cracked or uh, some limitations like this, which uh, cannot cover different types of materials. Okay, now you're working with masonry, but at least when you consider the material properties, you can think about adopting other property material properties in the future, which can uh, cover even non uh, brittle materials. Uh, that was the main motivation of uh, uh, making the proposal of my project, SIDMACIP, which has been started uh, in 2018 as a Marie Curie uh, project, which basically uh, the project has uh, three main tasks. Uh, and the overall idea was to develop a tool that this tool, first of all, 
can analyze the structural feasibility of a discrete element assemblage, and then it can uh, measure the amount of infeasibility of the assemblage and finally automatically adjust the, uh, the shape of the joints, the interlocking joints, so that an infeasible input becomes feasible. So this was the three steps of the uh, tool which I had in mind. And now I'm explaining- Can I of the Sure, sure. Interrupt, sorry. Uh, I, I was a little bit struggling at the beginning to understand what, what is meant by feasibility, but now I, if I understood correctly, the, the structure is supposed to be assembled without any mortar, right? Yeah, so, actually, we can also consider to be mortar, but um, what I explain now is the most simplest version, which is without mortar. And when okay. we don't have any mortar, this means that the, um, the interfaces or the joint cannot tolerate any tension. That means that when you have two blocks, then uh, when uh, be, um, with any small tensile uh, forces, they will be separated from each other. So I they see. always should be in compression. If yeah, so if, some, mm -hmm. yes. so we can see that there's either no mortar or a very weak mortar. And in any case, the idea of feasibility is about this structure being uh, Fully in compression. Fully in compression you, yes, without somehow. sliding, right? Somehow, okay. yes, yes. Okay. I, I yeah. also explain about the sliding and uh, the concept of fully being in compression mm -hmm. right now, because this is exactly what I briefly can explain in this slide. It's a good time to add uh, some uh, detail here, because um, the first task, which was a structural analysis, finding a structural analysis concept, because I had to adopt one of the existing analysis methods like finite element analysis, discrete element analysis, not important what are they now, but I had to adopt one of the concepts and then ex extend it for interlocking assemblages. And the main issue to which uh, approach is better was to find some simple and of course accurate model. Why? Because uh, as I explained earlier in the last stage, I want to have, uh, I want to develop uh, a shape adjustment procedure. And if I just want to say simply what that, what does that mean? It means that if you consider several iterations, at each iteration, uh, one of the um, uh, geometrical parameters are chosen and then it checks if with that geometrical parameter the model is feasible. No, it is not. Then another geometry, then another. So it should be iteratively uh, repeated. And that means that uh, each, if each it, uh, iteration takes like days or hours, then uh, it takes a long time to do the shape adjustment and optimization to find the optimal solution. So this is not the possible one, but the possible way. And that's why we have to find some simple and fast an a structural analysis. And what I chose is based on the concept of limit analysis. And what does that mean? That means that when we have a discrete element analysis, we consider each of the blocks to be fully rigid like that it never changes its shape. It always is fixed and uh, it never cracks. At this moment, we consider it that it, it is unbreakable. And that means that the only places from which the overall shape, the overall assemblage can fail are the interfaces or are the joints between the blocks. So which are here colored in blue. So these are the failure planes. The rest of the blocks will always remain unbreakable. And here, so the good thing is that based on this concept, we can say that each of these blocks always should be equilibrated. And by knowing the external forces applied to the centroid of each of the blocks, I can find the internal forces at the joints, which I think that only the failure can happen at the joints, not anywhere else. So if I can find the internal forces at these joints by uh, solving the equilibrium equation for each of the blocks, then I can check if these internal interfaces satisfying the constraints which I have in mind or not. What are these constraints? 
One of these constraints is as we talked, if they are dry joints, means that meaning that there is no mortar between them, they should always be in compression. So if there is any tensile, they might be separated from each other, like totally separated or just like a bending uh, happens and they start to be separated from each other. Or for example, uh, if the, uh, if uh, considering the friction Coulomb's law, uh, if uh, this limit is uh, violated, so for example, if you consider a, a friction coefficient for the, uh, for the joint, and then if this resistance is violated, then the blocks starts to uh, move, to slide actually with respect to each other. So this means that when we find the internal forces at the joints, then we check if they can meet the, uh, the constraints which I explained now, then we understand that the uh, overall assemblage is feasible, is a structurally feasible, it is equilibrated and it is, uh, and it is safe, actually, if I want to say. Otherwise, it starts to fail. It starts to, for example, a slide or separated or, for example, rotated with respect to each other. Several types of um, failure can happen in this case if these constraints are not satisfied. So this is the main concept of limit analysis. In the next step, which is important to explain now, is that sometimes we consider the blocks to be not fully rigid, but with the potentiality of being break, broken. So they are breakable, but we know actually from which uh, interfaces, from which uh, positions, the, the, this, uh, this potential, uh, I mean, this possibility can happen. For example, we know a priori now that if this uh, block might be broken, these are the lines of this breakage. How we can understand this? This is based on some experimental tests we've done before, the observing, for example, for different bond pattern, how this happens. So this is something which we guess we, based on our observation or experience, or for example, sometimes they are evidence actually. We know that if this rigid black block might crack, it breaks or crack, for example, from this line or this line. So this means that in this case, we can define two interface types. One is the dry joints between the blocks, and one is the internal unit interfaces from which a block can be separated. Again, we can solve the equilibrium problem and then put different constraints for different interfaces, solve the equilibrium problem, and simply find out if the model is structurally feasible or not. And actually, when I'm saying that we find the internal forces at each interface, I mean particularly that we abstract or simplify an interface to a number of points. And then I find the internal interfaces, uh, the, the interfaces to uh, these contact points and find the internal forces at them. So these internal forces, uh, I can consider three components for that. One component is normal to the interface, and two of them are tangential to the interface, and they are orthogonal um, with respect to each other. And then we can, for example, check if this is in compression or tension and whatsoever, which in the following, I will explain more detail about that. But this is the overall concept of using limit analysis, which basically in the literature is mostly for the convex blocks. Convex block means that we have uh, blocks which geometrically they are convex. Hmm? And also there are recently some words who uh, try to do the same for concave blocks. And again, they distributed several for, uh, contact points, uh, and somehow I can say they abstract the interlocking non-planar joints to these contact points, and then uh, they find it, uh, again the internal uh, forces at each of them and try to solve the equilibrium problem for that. The only problem. I don't want to say problem, but the only uh, thing which we usually should take into consideration about the concave block, which causes 
the non-planar joint is that when we have concave blocks, interlocking blocks, uh, ignoring the crack is kind of not safe. So we usually you can see, for example, if, if I have a convex block, I can consider it fully unbreakable and fully rigid. But when I'm looking at this shape, I can say, okay, the, the concept of breakage of this lock from the main body is most probable. So I have to take it into consideration when I want to develop the analysis for that. So, and uh, for, the, for the interlocking geometry, which I worked in my project, which was the corrugated shape, I considered two types of tangential failures. Tangential failures, uh, which is along the locks, and they are uh, followed by the frictional resistance. Uh, and the other one is when the uh, locks are separated and detached from the main body of the block. And you can see here using uh, these red faces, red strips here showing that uh, locks is detached from the main body. So I considered both failure modes. So to- uh, um, Sorry, can I? Of course, a sure. question. So the, the red stripes show that uh, so that the, this, a part of this block has been detached from from the a part of exactly. the, the the block at the bottom has mm. has uh, cracked and detached from from the main from the remainder of the body right exactly the uh, the, the picture above is like that they just simply a slide over each other so it means that those two interlocking blocks are remain uh I mean, uh, uh, they are uh, not broken yet. They are no? intact. They are okay. intact, okay. exactly. But in the below uh, picture, you see that uh, it is the, the locks are uh, somehow detached. We have a crack where I showed in red lines, uh, red faces here. Yes. And this is something which I believe uh, should be considered in the interlocking assemblages. We cannot ignore and completely fully consider it rigid because it's not realistic so much. Can I ask one more question? That in, in the sure, previous sure. slide or maybe two slides before you showed, yeah, maybe, yeah, mm -hmm. this one. Mm -hmm. You showed uh, normal forces and, and tangential forces. And you said yeah. we, uh, you said that you simplify the, the interface between the blocks, which is always assumed to be a planar interface, right? Uh, this case, the interface is planar. This is something okay. that, uh, like, for example, in the beginning, the limit analysis has been developed based on this concept that we have convex yeah. blocks and a planar interface. And this okay. planar interface, I mean, in, in reality, we have a, a 2D face, no? But we somehow, we can abstract it to some points and then just find the internal forces at these points. Otherwise, not, only, then, not only the block is convex, the interface between the blocks is also convex. Right? Uh, look, uh, no, this is something which is nice to mention here. Maybe I just try to skip that, not to make it uh, more uh, confusing. But the fact is that um, limit analysis um, is based on two approaches, convex approach and concave approach, which is different from convex blocks and concave blocks, which means the interlocking blocks. Convex approach is like, uh, let me see if I can use um, some, uh, so I hope I can draw if you see something. So, in yes. reality, we have two blocks like this. No, if, if you just imagine that we have two blocks and this is an interface shared between them, then uh, we have two versions, two types of uh, abstracting them. In the first abstraction version, we imagine that both, wow, I'm <laughs> drawing very bad, but um, just to um, show what I mean is that this is, the first abstraction um, version, which we assume that these interfaces are a bit convex like this, and as if that they are just in contact in one um, point in the centroid. 
something like this. Uh, you can see the, the, the drawing, my drawing, I hope. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. perfect. Then uh, when by this abstraction or simplification model, then uh, we try to find, um, let me change the color here. So for, for this case, we find oops, um, the normal forces, tangential forces, and also we need to find the bending moment here and then solve the problem. In the literature, this version of abstraction or simplifying the model is called convex approach. So um, we have convex blocks. This is another thing, but this is this called convex approach. Uh, this means that uh, this uh, one dimensional interface is simplified to one contact point, actually. Otherwise, if you want to consider, uh, we can consider infinite number of um, points here or just follow the finite element analysis, but it's time consuming. You just want to try to try to simplify the model. So another approach is exactly opposite. In the opposite approach, um, which I again use this, we consider that we have some kind of concave interface, something like this. So as if that there is, so this is just a, a hypothetically in, um, assumption, which I'm saying that this is a, this is a hole, it is hollow here. And then we can abstract this interface to be to these points here and here. So in the 3D version, they are four. In the 2D version, they are two here. And in this case, we only need to find the forces which are tangential and uh, normal we don't need any more the bending moment because in this case we need bending moment to uh, solve the equilibrium problem but in this case by only finding the normal forces at each and of these points this is amazing isn't it right yes yes exactly okay. <laughs> this is this much uh, this is this considerably simplify the problem because when you're talking about the 3d issue i will explain about this because in the 3D problem, the most important challenge is about the mixed torsion uh, shear resistance. And I will explain uh, in a few minutes about that, which if you want to follow the convex approach, this will be so huge and time consuming. But with this approach, you can simply uh, solve the problem. So I clear now all the drawings and um, so, um, I continue if you agree, uh, if there's no uh, uh, problem. Uh, okay, so um, so as I, I was here and I explained that uh, one of the simpler solution that we can follow is that we can consider, yes, we have uh, two interface types. One of them are dry joints and one of them are fracture planes, which uh, we might Think that the locks might be cracked at these at these uh, faces. Okay, we can simply uh, simplify them to a number of contact points and then find the um, internal forces, and that is fine. It, it it definitely works. But the problem is that then we have a large number of uh, points, and that might work for simple uh, two block assemblage or for example, less than 10 block assemblages, but not for a, an assemblage with 100 blocks, because then we have a lot of interfaces, a lot of blocks and points and whatsoever. It becomes so time consuming and it is doable, but not very uh, uh, computational efficient. So the good thing is about uh, this fact that when we are talking about a particular type of interlocking assemblage. So for example, in my case, it is a corrugated assemblage, right? It is some parallel locks, or for example, when we have a V-shape, a sinusoidal shape, then we know that what is the shape of the interlocking assemblage, then we can more or less um, uh, expect 
what is the behavior of this interface, and that helps us to simplify the model. For example, this is uh, the way that I simplify the model. And for that, I first merge each of these dry joints and fracture plane, like we, I merge them to a intermediate plane, uh, imaginary plane between them. And then I consider a center line for each of these merged strips. And I just put some contact points, just so you can ignore the one which is in the middle. I will explain you later about them. But just I can, uh, I put some contact points on this center line and find the uh, normal forces as I explained before here. So what is the main difference between this version and the previous version I showed here is that in this case, the tangential uh, resistance at this interface is isotropic and at each uh, direction, it's the same. So the tangential constraint, which I put here for this uh, force and this force, all are the same. The, 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 uh, the interface is isotropic. Here, uh, on the contrary, uh, it is orthotropic. This means that the tangential force, which is parallel to the center line, follows, and I just call it here RT1, follows a different constraint, a sliding constraint. And RT2, which is normal to the center line, follows another constraint, tangential constraint. So I call it orthotropic. Uh, phase because this is not anymore isotropic and they are different uh, tangential uh, or sliding resistance uh, which uh, should be satisfied in two different uh, directions which I explained better in the next slides. So just to simply explain it, it's like this that when I have a lock here and when I know that this lock uh, is subjected to a force which is parallel to the lock, I know that as long as the friction resistance of the uh, blocks are violated, the blocks are slided with respect to each other. For example, if you consider the a lower block, which is, for example, this block altogether, when we consider it fixed, and then uh, in this case, when uh, I have such a force, then it's just simply a slide. When the friction uh, resistance is violated. But when I have a force which is normal to the lock, and we have also, I can have a torsional uh, torque here, right? It means that uh, I have, uh, I don't know if you can see my hands, but uh, as I showed, this is like a mixed torsion and shear that's applied to the lock. And I can also show it with a force with some eccentricity. And then you see that the lock, it cannot move, but it can be cracked. And this crack could be like this. It depends on the eccentricity. If this, uh, for example, if I only have this uh, torsion here, then this can be, uh, when you, you see it from top, you can see that the movements, uh, the failure movements uh, will be like this, when the, the failure interface starts to crack, the failure shape will be like this, if um, it's clear. And when I, for example, have a mixture of uh, uh, shear force and uh, torque, uh, or for example, a, a force with some eccentricity, which they are equivalent, I have these types of mixed torsion shear failure. And in this case, it's very challenging to find out what is the torsion shear resistance of this uh, interface, which, as I told, it's an internal interface. It's an interface from which we expect that the lock is separated and cracked from the main body. So this is something which we, can, we could not find in the literature, and we have to uh, find out what is this resistance and then uh, extend the limit analysis based on that. And for that, we did several experimental investigation and numerical analysis using the discrete elements method by using 3 deck. And then we compared all of them together and I explained to you what this graph means here. Um, each of these graphs simply shows this, that when 
we have a lot. And this lot is subjected to a normal force like V and a torsional torque like M. The value, the combination of M and V should be smaller than uh, this curve that you can see here. So any value below this curve is valid. But whatever value is above this curve is not invalid. And this is something that we found uh, somehow numerically and also experimentally. And then the question is that if you want to use this limit analysis using the contact points, then what is the best version of distributing the forces? For example, uh, is it better to put it exactly at the end point of the center lines or a bit inside, or what is the best number of inter, uh, the contact points? So all of them are the question, and what is the best combination of the contact points, which make the resistance similar to the experimental and numerical analysis that we have done? And we compare that, all these options to, you can see with the experimental test that I showed here with the dash line. And then we found that the option number two, when we have two contact points, which the contact points are a bit inside the center line, and option five, which we considered uh, three uh, actually contact points uh, have the best agreements uh, with um, actually the experimental test. And that's, with all those information, we were able to develop the equilibrium equation. I just put it here just to show the overall methodology, but the numerical things is not that important here. I just explain simply that in the beginning, we try to solve the equilibrium equation by knowing the external forces. You find the internal forces, and these internal forces uh, must be uh, uh, satisfying some constraint, for example, uh, the constraint for the normal forces showing that they always should be in compression and for the sliding constraints showing that for the uh, forces which are uh, parallel to the center lines, they should satisfy the friction law and the one which is normal to that should be fo uh, following the shear resistance, which now I explain you here, the, the shear a formulation that we found and put it here and all together it helps us to um, develop a numerical method uh, for the first time that can analyze the um, uh, simply analyze the uh, feasibility of um, an interlocking uh, interface with corrugated shape. Sorry, can I maybe ask a question? I think. Of course, yes. It might be very basic for you, but uh, no, for my understanding. <laughs> so the the first equation, I kind of understand it. It's uh, mm -hmm. in, internal forces are the forces in between the blocks, right? Okay. Uh, in the oh. first part, the, the E, uh, this is the vector of all the external forces, like, for mm -hmm. example, uh, which they are applied to the centroid of each block. So it could be external forces like the gravity or any yeah, other yeah, external forces. Yeah. R is the vector. Uh, vector means that a list of- An array, the, an array of all those vectors, yeah. Okay. Exactly, the yeah. array of all the internal interfaces. And these mm -hmm. interfaces include the R ends, which- uh, The norm, normal components? Normal yeah. components, tangential components uh, in both directions. So this includes all of uh, those three components. Ah, okay. And the compressive one means that the, the normal components should be negative. So exactly. that indicates that they're compression. Okay. Exactly. exactly. Okay. And um, uh, this one is about the tangential components? So this is the, the, the Coulomb's friction law. And mu here means the... Uh, friction coefficient because uh, we always, based on the uh, Coulomb's law, we say that the tangential force should be less than the friction coefficient multiplied by the normal force. Um, so, like, I can also simply show. Uh, so, here. intuitively speaking, if you have more normal force, then the friction will be more, right? That, that sort of thing. Uh, just if I just want to show here. Yeah. If we have such a things, and um, for example, if this is the this is just under the gravity, then uh, for this uh, this interface that we have, mm -hmm. so we have uh, one. Uh, so let me 
erase this because it's so big here. Okay, so we have one reaction here, uh, which is exactly at the same of the gravity, but in the opposite mm -hmm. side. And then uh, if uh, we just move this uh, block like this, this is also a, a reaction like mm -hmm. this uh, in this direction. The, the friction, what we call friction force, right? Uh, this is a tangential force, yes, yeah, we can okay. also. And then there is a, a friction coefficient. So there is a relation between these two. Uh, mm -hmm. these two. So this means that if I just call it N here and call it T here, yeah. T always must be less than mu, which is just a coefficient, which we call it friction coefficient multiplied by N. Okay, and, so, and now we're talking about the magnitude of these forces, right? Not, yes, not, not yes. the forces as vectors. And this yeah, means that the friction should be sufficient to keep it in place, right? No. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, the friction, if this is like this, that like if this constraint is satisfied, then uh, there is no solution for this equation. So there's no sliding. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so it is like, mm, hmm. so this is the fact that we just give it to the solver. If by mm. this equilibrium equation and this constraint, the solver can find a solution, that means that the assemblage is in uh, uh, equilibrium, that is okay. satisfied, that the problem is feasible. If it and cannot then, find any solution, this means that, for example, no, the, one of these constraints is violated and because yeah. of that, the model is um, like two uh, slides, can be a slide or in the 3D can, you can have a torsion and a sliding together yeah. somehow. And sorry, the second one means, uh, it's a, it's a different kind of sliding, which is by failure of one of the locks uh, being completely exactly. uh, sheared out of its place, you know. Yes, by, yes, by I, can, I can explain better because yeah. um, this is actually, um, this T0 that you can see here is uh, a numerical value that shows that, uh, so um, when we consider uh, these strips, uh, these, for example, if we just simplify it to a rectangle like this, which I show from top, then there is a, a coefficient like friction coefficient, but it is independent on the normal force, and we call it cohesion. And cohesion means that uh, this cohesion multiplied by area showing the resistance of uh, this lock. Uh, and once this uh, resistance is violated, the lock starts to crack. So uh, this T0 is in fact the cohesion, um, like I can uh, call it just C here. The cohesion is a material property because it is kind of the, uh, the sheer uh, resistance uh, of the, uh, the material property that we choose here, if I want to say simply. Uh, multiplied by the area of the um, strip, or I mean, I call it this one as a strip because you rem if you remember, uh, it's one of we those have two wedges, right? Yes, they are. They, wedges, they, they, yeah. Uh, yeah, they merge them together. So if I just consider each of them, uh, I just simplify it, but you can consider it as any area of that by just simply multiplying uh, these two values to get the area and then multiply it by the material property showing the shear resistance of the mortar. I mean, not the mortar, but I mean the, the masonry, the, the property of the masonry. Then you can understand what is the overall uh, shear resistance of the lock and the shear resistance of each of these uh, points is the portion, uh, uh, a portion which all together, this portion is going to be one. Uh, I mean, for all of these, for example, this is, let me just close this. I go here and let me also remove that that you can see maybe here better. For example, here, you can see that if I say that T0 is the overall, uh, maybe it's here much uh, better shown, that if I consider T0 to be the overall shear resistance of this plane, which if it is, fails, the lock is cracked and detached, 
Then if I consider it the overall shear, the T0, the one third of this overall value shows the tangential resistance of each of these uh, actually uh, contact points. So it could be also different options. We searched for different options. For example, we gave them several even portions. If these two are more the, in the middle, they are less, and then search which of them is more realistic, more close to the experimental investigation, and we found out that these two values are more similar. So this shows, in fact, the constraint, the shear constraints, the shear constraints related to each of these contact points. This is how it works. If I may ask an even more basic question. No, of course, um, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. So you uh, mentioned that you calculate these forces and it's a very basic question. So how is it based on discrete element? Uh, mm. Is it by, by using a discrete element modeling? software or is it uh... no 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 this is something that i developed myself because as i okay. explained is that uh, so i can show maybe here uh better for example yeah, here, if exactly. you have a simple assemblage mm -hmm. then the only information i need is the coordinate of uh, the centroid so you, even you can use grasshopper or any other um uh, for example, mod, uh, modeling uh, uh, programming uh, languages that you have, you can uh, collect all this information, like the centroid of that, and then the distance between this centroid and uh, the interface which you need for the moment, for the bending moment, which I guess now maybe looks uh, somehow confusing, but it is super simple. I can explain you maybe by using some extra slides uh, in the end of, um, I mean, extra slides or some even pictures, I, I will explain, I can explain. But, but, and then by knowing the coordinates of these points and uh, just by knowing the, uh, the local uh, unit vectors of uh, the normal and tangential force to each of the interfaces, which nowadays simply uh, using many um, modeling softwares, as I told that Grasshopper or anything else, that uh, the, the uh, software automatically for you find this. So if you want, I can explain better uh, the equilibrium uh, how equilibrium um, uh, e uh, equation works. Otherwise, I can... That, I, I, I don't know how your plan is, but this is super interesting to me because I think it's an empowering it's message that that uh, it's a yes, we can do message that sure, we can yes. do. <laughs> I, I, so yeah, yeah. I can, I can explain you very simply. But I, I leave it up to you because I, I, I don't want to interrupt the... No, the I, I hope to... The I hope to make it simple. The only yeah. problem is that uh, because this is the first time I want to explain now, maybe mm -hmm. instead of making it simpler, <laughs> make it more confusing, but this is very simple. <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> so the fact is that uh, when, for example, I have uh, two blocks on top of each other, mm -hmm. then um, this I have uh, some information um, which I can simply collect them uh, by uh, just using a geometrical model. I know the uh, centroid and then, for example, the gravity at the centroid or any other external forces which can be applied to each of these blocks. So this is the first information which I can simply collect by uh, any software which already exists. So I just put all of those information and collect them as external forces in, in an array of external forces. Then another thing is about these joints in between them. So in these joints, um, which now I try to draw it uh, larger with the same color. So I just try to somehow zoom in, which I'm drawing very badly, but just you can consider it to be a linear line here. Then here, if I just uh, consider two 
points at the endpoints of that here and here. So we say that we are trying to find the value of these two vectors and these two vectors like this. One is tangential to the force and the other one is normal to the force. We already don't know what is the value of that because this is something that we want to find after solving the equilibrium equation. But we know something that if now, the only thing which is known is the uh, unit vector. The unit vector means that the vector which has only uh, its, its length is one. And this means that if I know that what is this unit vector, what, what is, for example, here, maybe the unit vector uh, x, y, and z of that can be simply collected based on the rotation of um, these interfaces and find the unit vector, which is normal to the interface, and then another unit vector, which is tangential to this interface, somehow like this. So unit vector is something known because we know what is the geometry of this interface. And once we know that what is this unit vector, which I can call it En and Et, for example, I know that the value of, uh, for example, normal forces will be something like R, if I just call this one and I call this two, I can say that R1, which for now it's unknown, we don't know what is this, multiply by um, En, which is known, this part is known, no? Then we uh, finally can have the normal forces. So this is, this is a value, this is a scalar value, this is not a, vector, this is vector. Then uh, when I multiply this as a scalar value to this vector, finally I can have this vector which shows the normal forces to this interface. I can do exactly the same for the- Sorry, R1 was, was the distance from the centroid, right? Oh, no, R1 is something unknown, no, because the oh, distance yeah. between the centroid is something known, oh, yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. I will explain. So it's R the mag some... magnitude of, of the vector. Exactly. I, let me just, that? yes, I, I, I can um, give it a better name here. I just call it Rn1, which means that it belongs to the first point, and this shows the value of normal force, which I multiply by n. So somehow like this. So for each of these blocks and for each of these interface, I can make this a matrix, and in this matrix, for example, so I'm talking about the, the first part of this matrix now, which uh, relates to the equilibrium of forces because we at the same time have to uh, equilibrate the forces and then equilibrate the moments, the torques. So in X, Y, and Z directions for one of these blocks and for, for example, only this face, because then we have to add the other faces and the other blocks. But this matrix, which I want to write here, just belongs to one of the faces and re with respect to one of the blocks. So the first part is about to equilib uh, equilibrate the forces. And in this case, um, if you know about the, uh, linear algebra, I can just write R1n, Rt1, which belongs to the first one, and Rn2 and Rt2. I hope that it doesn't make it more complex. I explain if it is not clear oh, to that. For me, but, it's super interesting. <laughs> yeah. So the fact is that um, by using this, actually, you multiply all the coefficients here by this value, and then finally you can uh, make it uh, equal to the external forces that we put here. So if I just I just try to not to make it more complex because now I don't know about the backgrounds, maybe that's just make it um, 
unnecessarily complex because it is basically very yeah, actually, simple. Yeah. We use the, the language of linear algebra for almost whatever we do. So that's mm -hmm. that's a, the most appealing form of explaining it actually you're doing. Oh, okay. Perfect. Actually, uh, the, the second part, uh, the so if we call the first matrix A and the, 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 the array or the vector X, mm -hmm. then... So this the, is, for example, this is, yeah. we call it usually the coefficient, equilibrium coefficient. Okay. So this is a coefficient, which then we multiply by the internal forces will be equal to the external forces. Ah, I see. So, so it's actually the same equation that you had written in those system exactly. of, that system of equations. Okay. Yes. This you is, I, yeah, yeah. Let me just clear um, this instead of C, I just give it the exact name, which I use that. This coefficient is uh, EQ, which is the uh, coefficient matrix. This vector or array is all the internal mm -hmm. forces. So, and then these all should be equal to the external forces, which these in external forces can go to the other side of the equilibrium equation, as I showed in the like minus E equal to zero, which is similar exactly to what I showed in that slide. So from and a he, mechanical point of view, this means that the, the external forces are assumed to be projected to the centroid of the interface, right? Not projection, but uh, this is exactly the equilibrium. This means that whatever force that you have at the centroid, uh, which it is it's, to solve this, it, uh, is like this, that when I have the, uh, for example, external forces here, then it shows that we try to find an array or a value of ex uh, internal forces that can equilibrate the internal or the external forces somehow. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, I, I'm really rusty here. So it's, it's the equilibrium uh, for F equals M, M A. So no acceleration means that the sum of forces should be equal. Uh, to here, here there yeah. is no acceleration. Uh, here we just have a, Moment. a, stat a static approach. No, for for yeah. here we only, for example, as this is a static approach, and for example, this is based on the fact that if I have a gravity here, then and I just call it, for example, F. This should be similar to, for example, two values. Here, which both of them are f over two half of f, something like this. So, in the first three row, we only try to uh, so the summation of the internal forces in the x, y, and z directions should be equal to the, va the value of external forces in the x, y, and z direction. This is how it works. So, if I just give it like x, like EY and EZ because now we are talking about the um, local uh, coordinate, but now we have to transform it to the uh, global coordinate here. So this means that if the EX is this and EY, so this is X, and this is, for example, EY here, and hopefully. I can also remove this and this here because in this case we have 2D uh, problem for 3D, then we have to add another row. But here you can, if I just put the value of this EN, as, as I showed you here, EN, so it's a bit chaotic here, but I showed that, for example, this X, Y, and Z could show the, uh, the unit vector for if E n. And then if I just consider the E, I put the value of E n, E n x here, and E n y here, and then E t, E t x here, and E, T, Y here, that this means that I know this value, I know this value, right? Because this is something that by any software you can find and it is a unit vector. So when I have this value multiplied by R1 on plus this value multiplied by R2, uh, RT1, then the summation of these two value 
must be equal to Ex, and because we don't consider, uh, and for example, this also similar uh, is the same for this is x for the first point, and this is repeated for the second point. For example, I should say I tend for x two, and like y for the second point, and uh, this continues like this for now. And the most important, I just um, don't continue here because this should be kind of something which we already uh, did for the first point. Now I want to go to the second section to uh, to to the uh, last uh, row of this matrix, which is related to the bending moment. And this means that, for example, if I have um, like this, I have a, sim a simple block and, for example, I put a gravity here and the normal force here, I cannot just say that, okay, this is same, these are in, um, actually, uh, these, these are in equilibrium. No, they are not in equilibrium because there is a moment here and, in fact, when they should be in equilibrium, I should, uh, instead of putting these two forces to be here, um, to be here, sorry, here and here. So then it is in equilibrium. So this means that I have to add another row here to cover the, moment, which this moment, uh, as you can imagine, that can, for example, be this rotation uh, on this block. And to find out that, we need uh, this uh, distance, which, which can be considered as a vector. And then we find the cross product of this distance uh, and this um, uh, unit vector. So the cross product. So you can you can simply find it uh, for finding the moments uh, as uh, the cross product of two vectors. So if I just have a cross product of E n multiplied by this vector, which I just can call it D, then I can uh, find out what is the amount of bending moment at this mode as at this point, for example. Uh, and then uh, actually for that, again, I when uh, this, this will be a, a vector and then I find the X value of that, uh, Y value of that, and just put the second and uh, for, uh, for the, 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 the last row of this column here and then solve the problem. Maybe it shows confusing here, I can share so I, later I will, I will, some. Yeah, I will yeah. ask you for your own papers and, and references. Yes, yes, references. Because in general, if we just uh, work on that uh, with one or two uh, simple samples, you can see that how much it is simple. It is very straightforward. But now maybe it can just become more complex. That's great. And I just can't. No, no, it, you, yeah. you, mm -hmm. you gave a perfect explanation, but. It, the thing is, I, I cannot pretend to have understood every single thing, but uh, yes, I it was a perfect explanation. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. So, the, the, thank yeah. you so much for the explanation. But just one quick uh, question of that. So the premise is that based on this equilibrium equation, we would end up with a simple set of equations for each one of the each pair of the blocks, right? Yes, and then, and then we have to have all the all them together because some of okay. this. So this is like this that. This is something which I may uh, can explain here much simpler because each of these interfaces actually is, mm, we can consider it as two interfaces, which are two faces, which are attached to each other. So mm -hmm. the fact is that, that how we consider somehow connect these two together numerically is that the value of inter, so I can draw it because this one must be simple here. So if I have a block here and have another block here, and then I assume that they are stacked over each other. So the fact is that for this interface, 
whatever value which I find, right, whatever internal forces which I find, must be exactly similar to the value of um, the internal forces which I find for this interface, but in the opposite direction. So this is how you uh, somehow numerically relate and connect these two uh, different equilibrium uh, problems to each other. You solve the equilibrium problem for this and, and this. And the only constraint is these two values, which should be the same, but reversed. In terms of volumetric blocks, an interface is always a face that has been shared between the two. Uh, there should be a phase, exactly, because these phases are how the internal forces are transferred from one block to the other block. So this is the concept of uh, flow of force uh, using limit analysis. Okay, I see. I see. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So um, let me just... Uh, yes, uh, looking at the time, I want to also reserve some time for the questions of students because I, I don't want to take all the time with my questions so if okay. you had other things to uh so I try to very fast to finalize what I uh, just say up to here so based on that we developed a plugin and this plugin had one of the components of this plugin for grasshopper was that based on the inputs uh then uh, these inputs would be, would be the assemblage, the openings, the supports, uh, the running, the, the bond pattern, the interlocking geometry in terms of the number of locks or the orientation of locks, and uh, actually the external uh, faces, the external uh, forces, and then based on all these inputs, it uh, calculates. But the problem of uh, what I explained here is that it only says if the model is feasible or not feasible. So it's like a yes or no. So it is not quantify somehow for us at how far we are from making a model feasible. And it is important for us because if we want to somehow automatically have a shape adjustment and reduce the uh, infeasibility and try to get closer and closer to, an in, to a feasible model, we should quantify that. And for that, we had to uh, we had we have to measure this infeasibility somehow. And this is the concept which I adopt was something which Emily Whiting did, uh, but she worked on uh, quantifying the infeasibility based on the com uh, compressive constraints, the normal forces. And I did it for the sliding constraints which related to the interlocking. Uh, forces actually. And in this case, I just briefly explain you the, the, how the concept works. The concept is like this that if I remove the sliding constraint as if the tangential forces can get any value, any arbitrary value, then when I solve the equilibrium equation and find the internal forces, some of these internal forces, of course, they are the interforce, internal forces which are violating the uh, limits, the tangential limits in terms of shear or frictional limits. And basically we can simply say, okay, if I just uh, sum uh, all these values together, the invalid values, I can take it as an infeasibility, infeasibility measure. That is nice. But the problem is that for any of uh, equilibrium equation, we might have more than one solution. We can have set multiple solutions. And in this case, the problem is that which of these solutions are solution that we want. And the fact is that we would prefer to get the minimum one, which shows that among all the possible solutions, we try to find a solution which is closer to the feasible model. This is the hypothetic answer. And the solver just give us one of them. So we have to somehow ask or force the solver to give us to, to give us this uh, solution. And one way to do that is uh, to decompose each of the tangential forces to two components. One is constrained and the other one is unconstrained. And the constraint by the friction, by the tangential constraints, which I explained to you earlier. And the unconstrained part is the part which we try to minimize it as much as possible because this is not what we want. 
And if we just try to minimize the amount of unconstrained values like this here and subject it to the equilibrium equation and the other constraints we need for the physical solution, then this value also shows us the, the, the amount of measure of invisibility, invisibility that uh, was the desired one, the minimum one. And based on that, again, we developed another, um, actually, uh, uh, component for the plugin that uh, giving uh, all these inputs, it shows the valid internal forces, invalid internal forces, and the measure of visibility, which if it is zero, means that the model is physical for any value which is positive and uh, more than zero, this shows that the model is invisible and we have to change the inputs to make it physical. And finally, we did an optimization, we developed a optimization, shape optimization a method, which tries to change the orientation. So if you see what each of these lines represents one of the locks, and it tries to change the orientation of the lock to remove the invisibility, or somehow in another word, minimize the measure of invisibility. So if this is the measure of invisibility for each of this log orientation, if the orientation is uh, shown by theta here, we try to minimize, we try to find a theta by which we can minimize the sliding invisibility, while the theta should be between zero and pi. And then by solving this solution, we can, for example, find the log orientation. And this is something which I skip now, but it is also another interesting thing, which is that we, of course, should also consider the assemblability of the model, because in this case, if, for example, the optimization solution finally finds the orientation, the lock orientation to be like this, we never can have any assemblage that can be assembled or disassembled somehow, so we have some deadlock. So this is also something which should be considered during the optimization which now I skip that and just super uh, briefly in two slides, I want to explain about the extension of uh, my project. And this is working on more complex geometries, uh, which uh, for now we call it a joint layout design, which we try to uh, find the layout of joints and the interlocking shapes, uh, which could be any uh, arbitrary shape by which we can find the strongest connections between two blocks and for uh, even any other assemblages. And we think that based on the new development in digital uh, uh, manufacturing, it is a good time to a timely thing to work on this uh, subject. And the overall idea, it's more, uh, the, the overall idea is simple. So I just quickly say that, but about the details, we can discuss about it. Uh, later, the overall idea is that we if we have uh, um, a ground uh, layout of all the potential segmenting line, the optimization that we uh, develop and we are developing for 3D models try to find um, the joints among all of these potential lines to finally find a combination of the joint layout, which finally gives us the strongest connection between the blocks or in another word, an assemblage with um, maximum uh, uh, structural load bearing capacity. So uh, this is all in all what I've done till now. I also have to uh, name um, my collaborators here, mostly uh, my supervisor, Professor Kasafulla, which uh, her uh, uh, I mean advises uh, me definitely helped me to proceed with the SIGMAC group uh, as I uh, really wanted to do. So that's it, thank you. And uh, please uh, let me know if there's any ambiguity or question, I would be happy to answer. Wow, oh, thank you so much. This was, uh, uh, this has left me with many, many more questions. And for me, that's a good sign <laughs> for a presentation. I'm, I'm really indebted to you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your insights with us. And You're welcome. I think uh, I will only be satisfied if we have several more talks about this of subject. Course. 
they're full of questions, but I will, I will keep my questions for a talk that we'll have later, hopefully. Mm -hmm. and of course, of course. My let, let, let me start with the, with the checking if the students have burning questions, and then maybe we can try to recapitulate what we have learned today. Um, please, uh, uh, everyone, please take this opportunity. OK, there's a first question. Tarek, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the nice lecture. I, uh, yeah, I, I really admire the, the effort that has been done for, uh, and the work is really nice. Uh, I really have a question related to manufacturing. Have you done any uh, research about manufacturing these uh, blocks? Uh, for example, which one is easier, which one is more uh, difficult to make or more effective? Mm, so actually, my, my... Mm. continue. Sorry, I thought that it's finished. Yeah, Sorry, yeah that, that was the question. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. just like related to um, how easy to, to have this in mass production, for example, or how, mm. yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, the fact is that uh, manufacturing uh, in terms of, for example, what is the limits uh, that we have to put if we want to use. Uh, so it depends on if we want to, um, for example, uh, make some molds and then uh, cast the blocks or somehow we want to uh, use the astrotomy to, for example, uh, generate the design. But the fact is uh, to generate each of the blocks. But the fact is that this is not my expertise. This is, I would say, my weakness. And I'm really uh, interested um, if somebody can help me in this line. But for now, uh, there is no geometrical constraints or related to the construction or manufacturing. But uh, this should be definitely uh, added to, to make a realistic uh, final solution. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they appear to be constructible out of stone right now, right? The, the blocks. Uh, uh, well, the fact is that uh, the, for, for uh, the corrugated geometry, it is basically, it's a, um, it is simple to be, uh, to be manufactured. First of all, because of its shape, it's not very complex to imagine that how it looks like. Uh, but uh, I talked about, for example, the, the concept of manufacturability of that, if we want to use the astrotomy of the glass shape, and it was also with uh, one of um, the researchers of Teu Delft, uh, I forgot her name, but uh, she uh, worked on the glass uh, blocks, interlocking blocks. And Petra? Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay, okay. Mm. And we and she talked about uh, some uh, some difficulties that can happen during the manufacturing process related to the concentration of the stresses uh, when we are working on the glass. So material by material and the construction limits like this can happen. This is uh, not what I've done till now, and I'm not super expert in this area actually. So uh, that's another reason to have another talk. <laughs> okay, not, not, not that I'm the expert, but uh, I, I think we can have a talk with Fedra and with, with uh, Dr. Fred Fia, also a colleague of mine. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, they're into this. Yes. Really, yeah. I, I have a question, which is that uh, uh, regarding a shell that is composed of a couple of uh, blocks, do we have any limitations in terms of the modularity? Do we have any limitations in terms of how different are geometries of each one of these blocks? Well, the, the plugin which I already developed uh, is limited to single shells. It means that, yes, it is mm, the shell could be any shape. It shouldn't be that, mm, not necessarily compression only. It can be any shell with any shapes but only in single shape. So one extrudus and one intradus, we cannot have several layers. And also the number of interfaces are limited. So we only can have uh, the polyhydrants with six faces interfaces and not more. Uh, these are the limits of the data structure which I developed, but this is only about the data structure of the tool. Um, if we have, uh, but the numerical, uh, formulation which I developed can be adopted for a different data structure. So in the future, if 
uh, yeah, we can work on more complex geometries. That is no limitations. But there's, yeah. but there's also no limitations in terms of the different modules combined together. For example, having a shell that has uh, three elements that they are being put together. Uh, no, actually, if I understand you well, um, if you if you're talking about, for example, the maximum limit number of blocks, is it what you mean? Or yeah. yes, there are some computational limitations. For example, I try to see. Uh, for a complex uh, SUDARC, uh, I saw that when the numbers were more than, I don't remember exactly, but if I remember correctly, for the 3D and complex geometries, when the number of blocks increased uh, more than um, 200 and the number of blocks are three, then uh, the, we cannot compute that. Uh, it just uh, give, us, uh, give us an error, yeah. This is, but this is only an implementation uh, limitation. It's not. This is, uh, yeah, yeah. This is a, a limitation which already I have in the workstation which I've done. I don't know if I uh, just improve the workstation. Um, that can okay. be. But the method, uh, the the method in its in itself, that does not impose this limitation. No, 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 no. I guess uh, the method uh, there is no limitation in terms of numerical. <laughs> Uh, uh, one last question that was uh, lingering there, it's less of a question, but something that I was thinking about, which is that this elegant formulation that, that, that you have proposed, uh, I think uh, I was thinking that it comes with a set of assumptions that has provided this simplification. I was wondering exactly. if maybe this, this, is, this yes. is a bit of a uh, uh, homework that I should have done earlier to check your papers, but I was wondering if there has been any validation for yes. this formulation. Well, we did some validation for that and we validated with the uh, numerically actually on the school arc, uh, but uh, we also put some constraints for validation. I mean, we, we validated with discrete element analysis using 3D for school arc, but again, for uh, making the validation similar to what we want, uh, we consider the main body to be rigid. Now I draw and explain you what are the simplification that we consider. For example, if this is an interlocking block that we have, we consider these and these parts fully rigid. So in the reality, we can have a crack here, crack here, here, sometimes here, right? This all could be some crack lines that we just simply skip that. And even in the validation that we did uh, using 3D, we consider this to be fully rigid and this to be fully rigid. But in the reality, this is something that, okay, one of the most uh, conservative way just to fix this is just to, for example, put some constraints on the geometry as if that with, with this geometry, the concept of having the idea of having this crack is more improbable, and mostly you might have this only have this crack somehow like this. But this is just some simplified, very uh, rules of thumbs, if I want to say. But if we want to have a realistic model, we have to consider all the crack lines yeah. in the model. Sorry, what was the name of the software application you mentioned before 3D? 3DEC, yes, yes. 3DEC. And you also mentioned something else. 3DEC, we know about. Ah, 3DEC is, um, I said that uh, the discrete element analysis based yeah. using the, because discrete element analysis uh, is something like FAM, like Ferenc element analysis, yeah, yeah. but uh, it uh, just uses the equation of motion uh, mostly. And 3DEC is a software that uses this um, method, the discrete yeah, element that, method. Yeah, that part I got, but I thought you mentioned something which sounded like scoot arc or something. Ah, scoot arc is the, the type of arc, actually, which is um, maybe I can show you. Uh, uh, how, how is it? How is it spelled? Uh, I can write it in the chat. Scoot arc. Ah, like oh, skewed. Oh, okay. Yeah, I skewed. See, I see. Maybe my pronunciation was not nice. Oh, okay. But yes, this. Mm, I'm trying to see if I can find. The, but an, an an arch is is typically how to say in in a plane, right? So um, by I skewed, was, you mean that it is I actually not you. symmetrical, right? 
I am going to show you the geometry of that. Just give me a sec to access if it's in the way. Okay. So I can show you all the analysis that we've done on that. And this is almost the accepted paper. We are waiting for its publication. But if uh, necessary, I can stop the recording. No, 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 that is yeah. fine. Don't worry yeah. about it because it is accepted. No, it's fine. Um, just let me clear all the annotations here. Okay. So, um, just let me see. Okay. This is a scoot art. Actually, uh, the final the final model that you can mm -hmm. see here, and uh, this is the three deck model that we developed. Here is not the interlocking geometry. This is uh, mm -hmm. the, with the flat face, but then later in the validation step. For example, this is on the uh, interlocking geometry that we simplified with these uh, lines that you can see here, based on the uh, actually uh, the software with the plugin that we developed. Mm -hmm. And this is the validation that we have done using 3 deck to validate uh, the model actually. So this is the good art, um, and you just can consider these type these these. Uh, are fixed. So the above part is the part which is mostly under the. Uh, so I think <laughs> maybe this is a, a good point to conclude. Uh, I don't know if I. Well, okay, 3 deck was not developed for architects, but it, it was my understanding that it was the only solution and a rather expensive solution for our numerical uh -huh. needs. And this uh, method that you, methodology that you have developed. If I understood correctly, it gives gives me hope that we can uh, we can use your plugin. Yes, for, yes, of course. Uh, uh, for validity, checking the validity of a of a masonry design. Of course, the fact is yeah. that uh, I have to also update a plugin. Now it mm -hmm. works finely, but now I, I use MATLAB for the sol as a backend for solver. Okay. Just in two or uh, one weeks, I try to use another solver, which is for mm -hmm. Ruby optimization, and yeah. then yeah. without connecting to uh, MATLAB, you can yeah. use a plugin. But even the, the the software is open source, and you can find it in GitHub. So okay. That, if if we could have a, a link to to your 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 software project, that would be great. Great, sure, of course. Uh, just if you give me this one week, which I told you to add the Corubio session, oh, sure, sure, sure. then sure. I uh, send you an email and update yeah. you about the link. And uh, yeah, I, I I will be interested in talking to you about some some uh, implementation details and also offering on the record our help if we can help with anything regarding implementation yes i would be personally very interested uh, especially adapting it to the to the compass framework from uh, from our colleagues in in, in eth mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. this this is very appealing to me and i i think i feel guilty for not having invited two colleagues that would have really enjoyed this conversation with you one is anjali merotra and the other one, Roban Oval, from, from both from ETH, former ETH uh, Block Research Group colleagues, um, who are uh, yeah, collaborating with us in, in the lab, uh, also in the graduation project. So they, they would have really enjoyed this conversation. But uh, yes, uh, it's a yeah, maybe, maybe next, next time. time. Next time. Sure, next yes. time. <laughs> Yes, yes. Next time. I, I, I yes. should have done a better job advertising also for your lecture. But, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah. thank you, Ivan, yeah. for, for this opportunity. I'm so glad no, that I, I can share. We, yes. we need to repeat this and, and or, or extend this. Anytime. If possible anytime. for you. And if I, if I may ask, uh, 
your permission to to pass your email to a couple of students who may have questions of course my pleasure yes and yes. please be uh, not don't be shy to to say no to questions if there are too many but <laughs> no, i would no, really no, appreciate it, if you could it nothing can be nicer than um, i mean showing some uh, interest from the others and i'm so okay. flattered and so interested to great see. no this yes. this is really great and I, I i must say i i cannot pretend to have understood everything it takes time to absorb but um hopefully we will go yes, through your papers if there is and, any, and, yes yeah. yes and if there is any uh problem and question of course i can answer gladly uh because with any detail there's no problem so it's great mm -hmm. yeah so i um as i said i'm, I'm full of questions and ideas to talk about but uh i i know that you must be tired this was uh very intensive uh i thank you so much for 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 the time that you you invested for for giving this lecture for us um if there are burning questions that cannot wait uh please don't be shy maybe i can extend a few more minutes it's a consultation time for Baolian, and she's the, the main concern party yeah, so I may have questions regarding the, I mean, uh, especially interested in the uh, job, uh, interlocking part. As you showed in one of the slides, there are uh, dry joints, if I understand correctly, is the uh, interface between two blocks. And there is a fracture plan. Uh, I think it's yes. the interface between the I guess you're joints about and this. the main. Am I right? Uh, yeah, with. Uh, with dry joint and fracture plans, maybe the next one. Uh huh. This one. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, the fracture plan is uh, the interface between a, uh, within one block, which is the interface between a joint and uh, its main body. Exactly. So if if we consider this main body and this is locked, and then this red uh, interface between them. Uh, shows that they are they both belong to one block and from that this would be fractured this would be broken yes please continue okay so like uh when you um digitally modeling this kind of modules will you uh, model it in separate part of the joint and the main body and apply different material different material properties to different interface or well, you? yes, we consider different material properties, but particularly for this specific uh, corrugated joint, as I said, we can somehow merge these two, for example, these two together, these two together, and just make some merged uh, final simplified model like this. And the only problem that how we consider both the fracture behavior and the drive joint is that then we consider the forces to be parallel to the locks. Uh, this uh, follows the frictional resistance. So it only needs to uh, respect the frictional constraint. If it doesn't um, respect the frictional constraint, it just starts to slide like this. It just starts to slide. And this other uh, internal force, which is normal to this uh, merged interface, mostly is followed based on the fracture, uh, the fracture plane constraint. And because of that, this uh, does not, um, this is mostly usually stronger than the other side because it can be uh, remain stronger until the time that the lock starts to crack. And because of that, we followed um, all these experiments to see what is the, uh, actually the, uh, the uh, torsion, mixed torsion shear resistance of this red, if I want to say simply, red strip, red interface. And then this is a, 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 the torsion shear resistance of that. For any value less than that, uh, this is feasible for any value more than that this is not feasible and then we did all the other uh, uh, efforts to see that how we can simplify using the limit analysis with some contact points so this is somehow that we merged uh, both the frictional 
uh, dry joints and the shear joints and consider all their constraints together somehow. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. So uh, I, I think I will ask you later for a couple of your papers that would uh, fit sure. best to the, to the content of this lecture to, to disseminate with amongst Yes, students. yes, very good idea. I, I can share with you the okay. more relevant uh, papers that uh, we already have. Right. Then, yes. I must say at the end, I, I'm really impressed with the complexity of the work and how well, you managed to explain all this in, uh, in I don't know how much time we have spent. Thank you. This, 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 this was a mission impossible, I can imagine. And Thank you uh, so much. I hope it was helpful. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. This is so mm -hmm. so complex, so complex. And and for, for good reasons, actually, the, the, the potential for um, making um, reusable structures, sustainable structures with masonry materials is huge. Yes. These are some of the challenges to to overcome to to uh, yes. to be able to build with this uh, humble exactly. simple materials. Yes. Exactly, if we try to have simple materials but stronger shapes, then this is the overall mission that we can. Yeah. Hold. yeah. The other thing I'm impressed with is is how unpretentious is this presentation. You know, you you talk about it as if it is natural and uh, and that. Uh, some, something needs to be done and you're just doing it, but it's much more than that. I, I, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so glad Thank you. I shared it with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I, uh, I won't take much more of your time and uh, I will get back to you with questions or ideas to sure. talk about. Sure, anytime. Uh, that was my pleasure. Um, thank you very much. In the future, yes, we will be more in contact. Yeah, that was my pleasure. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice evening in Have a nice Italy. evening and have a nice, yeah. thank you, and have a nice weekend also. <laughs> thank you, you weekend. too. You <laughs> thank too. you. Great, it Bye. was great meeting you. Bye-bye. Bye, goodbye. Bye-bye, thank you so much. Goodbye, you're welcome.